Part two, um, this is going to look pretty familiar for a lot of folks who have built reports already. And then I'm just going to look at how we go about assembling this uh, into a simple financial statement design. Um, so I'm going to break this apart into kind of five parts. We have parameters. Almost every report has parameters. Uh, in this example, we have you know, a year period in company, although that could be more things beyond that potentially depending on your report or fewer things. We have an account list, and as I identified before, you know, that for what we're doing here, that could simply be a list of accounts that you type. That could be fixed. So things are always in the same spot. Gives you some flexibility in where you want to drop in subtotals here and there and so forth. Or that could also be a dynamic list of accounts using uh, a query. Um, we have our columns. And in this example, current period activity and the year-to-date balance. You, know, you can also have monthly periods and you know, so on and so forth, or quarterly totals and whatnot in this column. Uh, your financial values, which we've just covered, how we pull those in using the TSGL amount function, and what's the pull. So those are kind of the five components that, that we look at as far as how a report is assembled. Um, I'm just going to kind of step through that uh, somewhat, and we'll see if any questions come out of that. But that way you have a chance to see kind of something coming together that, that looks a little bit more like a report as compared to uh, what I've kind of been throwing together ad hoc so far. And that'll also set us up for the next topic we need to talk about uh, in part three. So I'm going to just kind of follow this example here of uh, pretty similar to the one I just did. Okay, so I'm going to start with uh, with the list of accounts, um, which, by the way, let me back up here. I sometimes get ahead of myself. Um, when we're building something in Excel, um, you know, the, the visual quality, um, you know, the visual cues are important. We feel so. If these are parameters, um, it's a good idea to visually identify them in some way as a parameter. You don't just necessarily have to use our standard. Uh, we use kind of this shade of yellow and put a um, border around them. And that way, visually, the user can tell, hey, this is where I'm supposed to enter my parameters. Otherwise, you don't know necessarily. You might think something's a parameter and it's not. Um, also consider tools like data validation. So on our data tab, uh, we can say, you know, restrict the values in this cell to whole numbers. And we could say, you know, it's going to be year 2000 through 2050 or whatever range you want to put in there. And that just makes it a lot less likely that someone's going to put it, put in something that um, is invalid. You can also add an input message there. And there's a four digit fiscal year. And the cool thing about that is then that pops up as a little tool tip on that cell. So keep that in mind. Uh, you know, utilize tools like that that are available to you in Excel uh, to make sure that the, the solution works, works well, and doesn't allow invalid entries like that. Uh, as well as formatting something as text when it always should be text, never a number or a date. Um, and then the other thing that we always advocate is uh, and I didn't follow this in my earlier example, where you saw that I had um, a worksheet. Let me just come back to that here. My earlier example, if I just look at the formula like this, how readable is that? You know, I could look at this and go, okay, so what is A10? Again, I have to find A10. You know, what is A5? I have to go look at that and see what that is. The formula is not really very readable when we just use cell reference like I have here. Not that it doesn't work, it's just not as readable. So what we advocate for is name things. Whenever, whenever you can, assign a name to something. So I'll just go through the name box. I click the cell, uh, go to the name box, type the name I want to give it, like that. And 
now I can refer to those cells using their name instead of their cell address. Makes this formula a lot more readable. All right, so I'm going to move forward now. So that was kind of part one of the of assembling a report of, of the five pieces of the report that I was showing. Um, I'm going to go ahead and add a list of base accounts. And again, I'm kind of cheating a little bit in this case in that I, I don't want to have to type them, so I'm using a query to do that. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay. So I'll go ahead and finish that. There's my list of base accounts. And now I'm going to have a column for this period and then get to date. Um, Okay, so that's done to find the columns. And then part four in my assembling your report topic was adding the financial values. And again, I can use my function selector to do that. Now the function selector I didn't mention earlier, in order to click the function selector button and have this window come up, you must have a designer license, okay? Uh, just like you know, other designer tools where you know, I can't use the query wizard if I don't have a designer license, um, now, any of, any of the functions that, that exist, though, if you know the function, you can, of course, type it. So I can type TSPL out. And if I knew the arguments, I could type them out. Um, I can also click the FX button. Okay, and I can bring up that window like that. You have some options there. Um, okay, so now when I click on cell B4, notice that instead of putting in B4, it puts in prefix. And, and the name prefix will always only ever refer to B4. So I don't have to worry about making that an absolute reference or anything. Um, base account. I'm going to tap my F4 key a couple times to make the A be absolute. And then fiscal year is using the name. Period using the name. And then here's where I put in that value. So period. And it's not key sensitive, so you can use all lowercase, you know, but it, but it is going to require a valid um, type there, as I talked about earlier. Okay, so I'll click OK. Of course, it's up to you to flip the signs on things. So, you know, if, if you want your income accounts to show with a positive number, if they have a normal credit balance, you have to put, to put a negative sign in front of it. Uh, then we just copy that down. A little too far then. Uh, apply any formatting you want. Of course, we only do this one time. Once we build this, we save it, and then this is saved as a report that we can refresh over and over again in the future. Um, I can take this formula and just copy its text, or actually just copy the cell, and copy this across, and then change it. You're going to do that blank or just put in the word balance and copy that down. So now I have my financial values in there. And if you if you if you look at some of the uh, pre-built reports, you'll see like in the in the monthly comparison where there's a column for each month. Um, you know the, the period argument, for example, is referring to a cell at the top of each column for the period number. Just simple stuff like that. That's just ordinary Excel. Um, Formula stuff is what what you can do here. Okay, and then we add our, our totals. Now, um, it's normal for most people to to use a sum function right here, and well, and do it correctly, <laughs> unlike what I just did. It's normal for most people to want to use a sum function right here, and of course that works fine, uh, but. Let's say I now have another section below this for uh, cost accounts, and then I added another sum function, and I grabbed this entire range, right? Of course, what would happen? I would end up with doubled up numbers because I'd be adding not just the account balances, but also the total of the account balances. Uh, so I'm going to point out another function in Excel, which you may or may not be already uh, aware of. That's kind of the same thing as sum, but subtotal. And actually, you know what? What I what I ought to do is I want to bear with me. This won't take very long to uh, 
actually show an example of what I'm trying to express. I'm going to add a list of um, base accounts for cost. Of course, when you build the query, you don't have to include the column captions. You can put in your own captions and stuff. I'm disregarding that right now. Here's my cost account. I'll well, copy those same formulas down. Um, of course, I don't want to reverse the sign. In these cases, those will normally debit balances. Okay. So let's say that I insert a insert a total here using the sum function. And I do the same down here. This is actually not a great example because I wouldn't actually add all those together anyway. Um, I don't want to do that if I guess these were. And forgive me for not providing a great example of what I'm about to talk about. Um, this probably applies more to like if you have multiple sections of uh, expense accounts or something like that. But again, a, a good thing to be aware of. So if if I were to add up uh, all of these amounts, presumably the net would be my, you know, my, my gross income, right? Except that the total of those sections is also included, so it's kind of doubling that up. Uh, that, that was kind of the point I was trying to make, was that in theory I could go sum and then just pull in all of that and wind up with the wrong number. Um, that's why we would use subtotal. Subtotal is smart. Now, it allows us to get different aggregate values. So the number nine is the sum. Yep. Keep in mind that it has two arguments. One is the type and the other one is the range. But if I use a subtotal here, okay, those totals didn't change. And I use a subtotal here. And then I can still go ahead and subtotal this entire range. And subtotal is smart enough to skip other subtotals. And that's the point I'm trying to make. Okay. That's pretty handy Mike, I have a when you're building. Clarifying question prior to moving on. So you've got totals on here, and I have a function that's going to return a, a, an amount. And I've specified, you know, a balance. If I have a P&L account, obviously that's always going to be year to date because they go to zero. So at any point, this could be year to date. But if I have a balance sheet account, can I control whether it returns year to date or life to date as of that cutoff point? Yes. Um, those are two different uh, value types. So again, if we go back to the function selector documentation and scroll down to the list of values, um, you'll see there's there's balance, there's period activity, and there's year-to-date activity. So if your balance sheet account, if all you want is what's what's been posted this year, you use year-to-date activity. Otherwise, balance is your running balance. And for a P&L um, account, yeah. balance and year-to-date activity are the same. Are the same. Yep. Yeah. In fact, uh, behind the scenes, uh, it doesn't matter which one you select because it follows the same execution path to get to the value because we recognize that year-to-date and balance are the same thing for uh, income statement accounts. Okay. <laughs> All right, so that's, um, you know, that, that was that was part two of our, of our training today was just kind of a walkthrough of assembling a report, uh, perhaps covering some more detail than, than you're expecting, but you know that the main point is I wanted to be able to show uh, an example of just putting all the pieces together into into uh, something that looks reasonable, like a, a financial statement. Um, the the next part of this is kind of addressing where things can go wrong. If, if you're not aware of a couple of of things as far as how Excel works and how queries work, and really this applies to queries. So I'm gonna. Step back there. So when I say query, just to review, again, I'm talking about this range on the 
on the worksheet that's made up of multiple rows. Um, I build it using the query wizard, and when I refresh the data, you know, if new accounts have been added, it actually inserts new rows and it copies copies these formulas down to the new rows. So it's, it's dynamic; it expands and contracts as necessary based on what's in the database. So that's what, what a query does. And again, anything to the right of it, you know, copies it down automatically as well. Thank you.